Hello, everyone. This is the November webinar presented by the Essex County branch of Ontario Ancestors. Thanks for joining us. Just a reminder that this presentation is being recorded and will be added to our YouTube channel. Also, questions will be answered following Lorraine's presentation. Just add any questions as we go along to the chat box, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. Sometimes it's at the top of the screen, one or the other. Here are the links that we show every webinar, but it is useful to visit them periodically as new things are added all the time. Feel free to take a screenshot. The first link is to our parent organization, Ontario Ancestors, where you will find many Ontario resources. Just add your ancestor's name to the search bar and see what you find. Next is the link to the Essex Branch website, which has Essex County resources, including our members library, which is packed full of local resources. Other links include our YouTube channel where you can review past presentations. And we always encourage you to interact with us by joining our Facebook group and following us on Twitter and Instagram. The 2022 membership campaign started on November the 1st. There are great early bird prizes and Grow Our Family is back. If you can partner with someone who wishes to become a new member, you and the new member will get a 50% discount on the membership fee. But the deadline for this offer is December the 15th. It is a great bargain. So if you want to take advantage of this discount, just email us at essex at ogs.on.ca or post on our Facebook group that you're looking for a partner. We've already hooked up a few new members, but we are always looking for more. If you didn't see it, our cemetery team made the front page of the Windsor Star. The article reported on the work our team is doing at the Windsor Grove Cemetery, unearthing headstones. In the picture, part of the team can be seen. C.J. Scott, Rosemary Lanou, Marty LeBlanc, who is almost hidden in the picture. He has the nickname Digger. And Pat Clancy in the red shirt is the cemetery coordinator for the Essex Branch Cemetery team. Their work at the cemetery will be on hold for the winter months. And now the transcribing of the headstone begins. Pat needs volunteers to assist with this important work. So if you are interested, please contact Pat at Essex Cemeteries at ogs.on.ca. We're also very thankful to Darlene Baudet, who has donated her family collection of photographs, as well as the family history started by her grandmother, which contains information and pictures of the Schneider, Quick, and Herman families, as well as others. We are in the process of putting this all together to post in our family history section of the Banks Library. If anyone else wants to donate their family history, please send us an email and we'll set it up. Along with Cindy Robichaud, who is representing the Kent branch, we have recently met with members of the Federated Women's Institute of Ontario to learn more about their project to locate and scan the Tweedsmere history books, which were prepared by most, if not all, of the, Windsor, of the Women's Institute branches in Ontario. They had only located one book from an Essex County branch, and none from Kent County and needed assistance to locate the books of the other 50 branches. Both Essex and Kent branches have agreed to attempt to locate and scan the books we can find. They will then be posted on the Women's Institute website on the Tweedsmere Histories webpage. These books can provide you with both valuable historical as well as genealogical information of the area. You can see here that the Olinda book has been has been recovered and we're now working on the Anderden and the Malden books. We also wanted to let everyone know about a special presentation being hosted by the Kent branch of Ontario Ancestors that is open to everyone. It is a Family Tree Maker live chat for those who already use Family Tree Maker software to record their family history, but also for those just interested in hearing what the Family Tree Maker can do for you. 
Mark Olson, the Family Tree Maker Ambassador from Utah, will answer any questions you have about Family Tree Maker and its partner product plugins, chart companion, and family book creator. So bring your questions on Saturday, November the 23rd. You will find the link to register for this session on the Kent branch of Ontario Ancestors website or on the Essex or Kent Facebook group pages. I've been using Family Tree Makers since, I don't know, since it began, I think, and I love it. So I'll be there. And more educational opportunities are available with these upcoming webinars. This Thursday, the Lambton branch offers War Brides, and on Friday, the Kent branch has secrets and surprises in the family tree. The Essex branch does not offer webinars in December or January, but in December, Ontario Ancestors has a webinar on scrapbooks, and the Lambton branch presentation will help you to understand Wikitree. Ontario Ancestors will, will also be offering a January webinar. More information will be posted about that on the Facebook page. And starting in February 2022, our webinars change to Monday nights. And we are excited to announce that we will start the year off in February learning about Loyalist Heroes. Sorry, I just had to have a drink of water. Tonight's presentation features Lorraine de Serbo, who will introduce us to the sources available on the French Canadian Heritage Society of Michigan website and how to use them effectively. Lorraine has been conducting genealogical research for over 23 years. She has been a longtime member of both the Centre for French Colonial Studies and the French Canadian Heritage Society of Michigan, including holding three positions within the society registrar, president, and currently she's the editor of Michigan's Habitant Heritage, the Journal of the French Canadian Heritage Society of Michigan. Her primary focus of research centers around the four colonial forts of Fort Pontchartrain in Detroit, Fort Michilmackinac in Mackinac City, Fort St. Joseph, which is in Niles, Michigan, and Fort de Chartres in Prairie de Rocher, Illinois. And, her and her, she does research the members of the De Chetra and Chevalier families present at those and other colonial fur trade locations. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and pass it along to Lorraine. Well, thank you for inviting me to your meeting tonight. I really appreciate the invitation. And uh, as you stated, um, my presentation is involving the sources available on the French Canadian Heritage Society of Michigan's website. Uh, basically, we, I'm going to give you a bit of a background about our society overall. And for some reason, hmm, I'm, I'm going to try this way. There we go. Okay. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about our society to begin with. Uh, if there's anything to write down, this is the one thing. The uh, website itself is uh, www.habitantheritage.org. Uh, it's fairly easy to find if you just search for French Canadian Heritage Society of Michigan. We are the first thing that pops up. Uh, we have a page with contact information, mailing address, email uh, information about our board. Our president is currently Barbara Freed. Uh, and we have uh, a wonderful group of, of women who hold various different positions. Uh, Karen McAlpin is our corresponding secretary. Joanne Murphy is our membership chair. Rosie Kutcher is our treasurer. Don Dono Donowski, Don Evo Donowski is our vice president. And uh, we have additional wonderful ladies who have been extraordinary in uh, helping uh, write articles and serve on committees. Uh, Gail Moreau, Days uh Diane Shepard, and Suzanne Somerville have been instrumental in uh, providing material for our journal and uh, research resources for our website. Uh, 
our mission statement is basically that our group was organized in 1980 as an educational, historical, cultural, and genealogical nonprofit organization uh, committed to making people aware of the rich culture and history of French Canadians in North America. And that remains our purpose even today. Um, our journal is very involved. Uh, we have many articles. Uh, I'd say 99% of them are written by our members. Uh, there's an occasional journal article that is uh, either uh, put in from uh, another article uh, somewhere else that is a reprint with permission. Um, so they may not always be members, but for the most part, uh, it's our members who write the articles. We are always looking for new members. If you are interested in French Canadian history and have a wealth of information to share, we would also love to have you uh, contribute to our journal as well. Our meetings are normally held on the second Saturday of each month through the months January through May and September through November. We do have a couple of special occasion events that occur during the course of the summer, uh, but as of right now, we haven't been having many of our meetings in person. We are still mostly holding Zoom sessions as our uh, library meeting place has been under renovation for about the last six months and is planning on being that way for at least another year. So most of our meetings are still online at this time. Uh, we do also uh, publish books. Uh, we currently have one series available. It's Le Détroit du Lake Erie, uh, years 1701 through 1710. Uh, volume one was written by Gail Moreau Desarnay and Diane Wolford Shepard, and volume two was written by Suzanne Boivin Somerville. Uh, and although the title is in French, the books themselves are in English and very easily read. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, uh, with everything that's been happening with postage and uh, uh, the uh, cost of, of uh, what's been going on with the pandemic. Um, our books have not been available on your side of the border currently. It costs more to ship them than it does for the cost of the books themselves at this time. So uh, I, we would love to be able to get them back to Canada hopefully soon. Uh, our membership is calendar year from January 1st through December 31st. It's uh, US $30, Canadian membership is $35. Uh, we provide four issues of our journal. Uh, they, are in, they come out in January, April, July, and October. Um, by being a member of our organization, in addition to getting the four journals, you also get extra content on our website that is uh, accessible uh, with username and password. Uh, we also have all our back issues of our journal that have been digitized since 2007 available to access with uh, paid membership at any time. Uh, this is a, a quick look at our members only section, you know, where you would put in your name and password and uh, be able to access the content. Now we're going to go into uh, the French Canadian resources provided on our website. This information is freely accessible to anybody. You don't have to have a paid membership to be able to access this. Uh, the first page is uh, involving Canadian, Acadian resources. Uh, we have uh, various different links to uh, uh, podcasts by Sandra Goodwin, who has a wonderful series called Maple Stars and Stripes. Uh, she has a wealth of information through those podcasts, and they're definitely wor worth checking out. Uh, we do have some links to them on this page. Uh, we also have various different links to items like the Acadian Memorial, uh, the CBC series, the Acadians, uh, Acadian and French Ancestral Homes, uh, the Acadian Museum on Prince Edward Island, the Nova Scotia website, Acadian, Ca Acadian Cajun Genealogy and History website, uh, Canadian Encyclopedia, and the Marianapolis College website as well. In addition, we also have uh, the site Acadian.org and Mappinopolis. 
Uh, we also provide uh, various different bibliographies. Uh, we mostly in, we're mostly involved with the Michigan Great Lakes Detroit Li River region from the 17th to mid 19th centuries. Uh, but we do also provide bibliographies for Native American culture in that area, the Mississippi Valley, Great Lakes Plains area, uh, the uh, 17th and 18th century immigrants to New France. Uh, Pontiac's Uprising, and we also have uh, a recommended book list uh, involving uh, history and culture of Michelin Mackinac, Fort St. Joseph, and Detroit during the French regime. Uh, we will go into some of those areas in more detail as we have individual pages for some of those locations. Uh, we also provide book reviews. Uh, not all books are created equal, and our members uh, like to uh, review them and indicate uh, which sources are, are reliable and which ones aren't as accurate as they could be. Uh, we have a list of those here on the website and uh, they're definitely worth checking out. Uh, we also have links to the Caring In Regiment, uh, various different resources, articles, uh, lists of the soldiers, genealogies of the soldiers, and migrations of where they, they went to over the years. Uh, we also have very various different census information. We have very early records for the Detroit censuses uh, from the year 1710, 1749, 1750, and 1762. Uh, transcriptions and image links when they're available are on here. We also have links to the Quebec censuses for the years 1666, 1667, and 1681 available as well. We also have links to French Canadian culture and heritage. Uh, we have a variety of articles and pres PowerPoint presentations. Uh, present on here. Uh, there are uh, marriage contracts and the custom of Paris are discussed by Suzanne Somerville in these articles and presentations. Uh, we also have articles uh, written by Diane Wolford Shepard regarding various different cultural metissage and different uh, clothing options worn uh, over the years by both French Canadians and Native Americans. Uh, we provide book recommendations by Tim Kent, who is a longtime member of our group and has a wonderful, wonderful series of books, very detailed in French Canadian history and culture. And we also have linked to the Virtual Museum of New France. We also provide uh, a set of Detroit River region charts, which was initially created um, through the Detroit 300 celebration celebrating the tricentennial. And it was created to allow descendants to trace their history or their ancestry and uh, submit for uh, charts that uh, or documents of heritage that were provided at that time. And by sending in those charts, we compiled all of them and eventually we put them on our website. So they're listed uh, alphabetically by surname and you can find any charts that are related to you and you might find a whole host of cousins that way. Uh, we have a special section specifically for the Detroit River region. Uh, we have different uh, links to notary records. We'll go more in depth into the notary records. We do have another whole section on notary records by themselves as well. But we also have articles and PowerPoint presentations available involving the details of the Detroit River region, uh, things like uh, myths and realities of uh, Robert Navarre, our first Detroit royal notary, uh, misconceptions, misunderstandings, myths and facts, regarding the French Canadian and Native American uh, relationships within the Detroit River region. Uh, there, there's a, a whole bunch of different presentations 
articles written by our members that are, are present here. We also even have a, a link to the digitized book, The Windsor Border Region by Ernest Lajeunesse, uh, which is uh, another great resource. Uh, We also have a link uh, showing you uh, a monument that we uh, created for uh, those who were initially interred at St. Anne's Parish in Detroit, but were uh, reinterred uh, in Mount Elliott Cemetery at a much later date when they started developing the riverfront. And uh, it, they were left in an unmarked grave and we felt that that, was, that needed to be addressed. And so we created a monument in 2010 with the help of uh, the late Sherry Somerset and Suzanne Somerville, who took it upon themselves to uh, start the process. And we developed this wonderful monument and we try to celebrate yearly. Uh, we try and go out there in August uh, as an annual, annual remembrance ceremony for those who were uh, reinterred from St. Anne's in Mount Elliott Cemetery. Uh, we also established uh, a plaque downtown in Hart Plaza along the Detroit Riverfront, um, and it honors the 52 voyagers, hired men and soldiers that were hired by Antoine Lamotte sur de Cadillac uh, to come to Detroit and establish the fort here. Uh, in addition, not on the plaque, but uh, in 2015, uh, one of our members, Gail Moreau Desarnay, also discovered that there was an additional man who signed the contract to come on that first co uh, convoy. And uh, his name was Francois Rivard, in case any of you happen to be uh, related to the Rivards. Uh, his name should also be on the plaque, but at this time it is not. Uh, we also have a site specifically uh, involving links to the Fee Amarie, the marriageable women who came uh, between the years of 1634 and 1662. Uh, we also have additional, uh, we have a podcast from Sandra Goodwin here as well. Uh, we have various different book recommendations, online links and resources to various different groups uh, that have lists of these women. Uh, Fisher Origin is good. Um, there is uh, Dennis Beauregard's Genealogy of the French in North America, which is another wonderful source. Uh, we also have different uh, additional sites that provide uh, genealogical details. And we also have a host of our own articles that discuss the Fi Amarie as well. And we also have uh, links to the King's Daughters, the Fi Duwa. Uh, some of these are the same sources as for the Fi Amarie, but there are also additional sources as well, uh, PRDHIGD. Uh, contains a list of Fidu Roy. Uh, Peter Gagne's book, The King's Daughters and Founding Mothers, is another wonderful source. And there is also another society, uh, La Société des Filles du Roi et Soldats du Carignan, uh, which is another French Canadian heritage group that uh, provides certificates to those who prove their connections to either the King's Daughters, soldiers of the Carignan Regiment, or in some cases, both. Uh, their link is below here as well. Uh, now to discuss a few of the different locations. Um, these are some of the more prominent locations for French Canadians within uh, the state of Michigan. Um, Fort St. Joseph was very prominent and a highly developed French Canadian post. Uh, it is currently in the city of Niles, Michigan, and has been uh, under archeological uh, analysis for a number of years. I'd say it's uh, well over 20 years by now. Um, we provide various different articles uh, by our members, and we have a list of family profiles on this page uh, for those who were present at Fort St. Joseph. Uh, we have links also to the Fort St. Joseph Archaeological Project. They offer a booklet series delving into more details uh, of those who were at the post 
and so some uh, categories of them as well, people at the post, uh, women at the post and so on. Uh, educational panels and the Fort St. Joseph archeology span blog. Uh, there's a link to that as well. So if you have interest in the project, you can always uh, tune into that and see what the updates are over the years. Uh, we also have a page involving the fur trade itself in New France. Uh, we have various different PowerPoint presentations on the Chevalier family. The Forgotten Voyagers, Notarial Records. Uh, we have different uh, articles involving the fur trade. Uh, we have representative fur trade contracts and then various different additional resources, uh, articles uh, involving the fur trade through our journal, Michigan Habitant Heritage. Uh, we have links to the Montreal notary records, notary microfilms, links to the online books uh, of Colonies, which were licenses or agreements, and engagements, which were hiring contracts and various other different uh, as well. Uh, there's also an online database of Voyager contracts and miscellaneous articles relating to the fur trade. Uh, as we get to the actual notarial page, I will discuss these uh, in more detail because there is a trio of sources that work really well together on our page. And if you've never uh, delved into notarial records, uh, this is a really good place to do that because uh, it's, it's very well organized. And uh, the PowerPoint presentation on this page of notarial records goes in significant depth into how to research them. Uh, we also have a page involving the history of New France. Uh, various different links to online books and resources, such as René Jeté's Dictionnaire Généalogique de Famille du Québec, uh, Des Origins, uh, 1730. Um, you do have to have a, a, a membership to genealogyquebec.com, which is a paid membership. Uh, there's also links to Fisher Origin, uh, Dennis Beauregard's Genealogy of the French in North America. And these are subcategories of those pages as well. Um, there's also links to James LaForest's Our French Canadian Ancestors. Uh, the links are digitized through Family Search. Uh, so it's a free site. There are various different articles about 17th century history. And uh, Diane Wolford Shepherd, one of our, our members of former editors, uh, has created a timeline of different links. Uh, involving the exploration, missionary work, and fur trading within the 17th century. We also have uh, sets of land records within the Detroit River region, uh, various different grants that were uh, provided by Antoine de la Motsure de Cadillac between the years 1706 and 1710. Uh, links to land concessions for the years 1734 and 1736 which you can, can be found through Library and Archives Canada. There are additional links for various different concessions between the years 1734 to 1752, which can be found in Bank or also known as Peace Starred for those who've been around for a little while. Uh, there is also the Edward Seacott Ledger, uh, which is an, uh, transcribed and annotated by Gail Moreau Desarnay. And it involves a number of uh, individuals who came to the Detroit land, to the Detroit area between those years, uh, and uh, the items that they were given for uh, for coming here. Uh, there are also various other land uh, records available that can be found through both either Ancestry or the Burton Collection, which is here in Detroit. Uh, some can be accessed online, so you actually would have to come to the library to examine. We also have um, a page involving medical issues, DNA and mtDNA. Uh, we have various different articles. Uh, one of our members uh, wrote a, a sig significant article uh, on the founders effects, um, which uh, involves certain members of uh, the uh, initial group 
coming over to New France and some of the genetic uh, conditions that have gone down generations uh, over the years, uh, different conditions uh, that are, are known to be present within French Canadians specifically. There are also uh, links to um, articles involving the cholera epidemics. There are uh, articles involving DNA updates, uh, some involving different ancestors. Uh, there are a couple specific ones involving Catherine Piard, if anybody's related to her, because her ancestry has been a little tricky and there's been some misinformation out there. So we've got some articles on her to try and clarify uh, her ancestry because it's been uh, uh, done through DNA a little bit better. It's been broken down. We also have links to the Genographic Project, which is uh, done, it's uh, provide, provided by National Geographic. Uh, Family Tree DNA has a link here for understanding their results. And uh, there are also DNA results for Native Americans on this page as well. We also have a page specifically for Michelin Mackinac. Uh, it involves historical background. Again, we have a series of links to various different family profiles on this page. We provide additional book recommendations for those who've written uh, very informative books on this area. We also have a series, we have some of the maps uh, like the uh, one provided by Lobdinier uh, early on, uh, which shows all of the different people who owned property within the fort at the time. Uh, we have uh, a series of articles. Uh, Suzanne Somerville writes a wonderful set of But I Read It articles, which are present on this page as well. And there are also additional links provided uh, as well. We also have a page uh, with 17th and 18th century military records. Uh, they discuss various different uh, subsets. Uh, we have uh, an article written by Suzanne Colby uh, discussing the capture of uh, captives of the French and Indian War. Uh, Diane Shepard provides a three-part breakdown for the Deerfield captives from 1704. There are some articles on the Fox Indian attack that, was, that occurred in May of 1712. We have goods and service provisional records from 1730 to 1750, uh, a timeline and militia lists uh, from the War of 1812 by Diane Shepard as well. Uh, we have uh, Michigan militia lists. We have information on the Patriots Rebellion and additional book recommendations and bibliographies involving military history. We also provide just a list of, of miscellaneous resources, um, things like, you know, famous distant cousins, uh, additional genealogy links, which are more generic, but provide uh, a great deal of information like Cindy's list, US Gen Web, Canada Gen Web. Uh, we also have PDF files involving national, regional, state, local French Canadian genealogical societies, and also links for archives, libraries, museums that have French Canadian content as well. Uh, it may seem a little far, um, but we also have a link to Mississippi Valley resources. Um, for those of you who weren't aware when the English took over after the uh, French lost the French and Indian War, uh, many people didn't like the idea of being ruled by the English and many of them headed west and many of them actually went to the other side of the Mississippi River where Spain was still in charge so that they didn't have to be under English rule. So if you've ever found that there are ancestors that you can't find and they just kind of disappeared, you might want to look west because many of them migrated that way. So we have a series of information for the Mississippi Valley here. Um, Gail Moreau Desarnay has written uh, a wonderful article on Gabriel Richard in the Illinois country. Uh, we have various different parish records for the Diocese of Belleville, Illinois, and the Archdiocese of New Orleans, which may seem uh, obscure, but actually Missouri 
uh, was in New Orleans at that time. So New Orleans was a huge area. And so it covers uh, a great vast uh, amount of area and uh, records. And <clears throat> we also have a short bibliography for the Mississippi Valley and a list of links that are organized by state uh, so that you have an idea. They're broken down a little bit more. Uh, now, here's the section on notary and court records. Uh, as I uh, alluded to before, uh, we discussed the, the Coutume de Paris, uh, which is the customary laws that were practiced in Paris. Um, we have uh, individuals that provided legal services. Uh, attorneys were prohibited in New France early on. So there were other practitioners who became notaries and who performed these acts. So we have different types of notaries. There are royal, there's seniorial, there are parish priests and commandants. Uh, most of the notaries uh, were done in three main areas, which were Montreal, Quebec, and Trois-Rivières. Uh, there are many sources for notarial records, but uh, the main ones you can find are Bunk, uh, Parchman Database, and Family Search. There are uh, different types of notarial records. There's many different types of notarial records. There's engagements. There's uh, various different loans. There's congés. There, there are marriage records in some of these notarial documents. There, there are all kinds of records. Uh, there are also court records, uh, lawsuits. Uh, uh, many of them can be found in bank as well, along with appellate court links. Uh, I'm going to uh, establish, uh, between this and the fur trade page, there's a lot of information on the notary and court records. Uh, the three main links together that really make it easy to look for the notary and court records uh, especially if you're looking for voyagers, is uh, to start with the voyagers database. Uh, the voyagers database is a search searchable database that allows you to put in a surname and it will pull up contracts for those who are hired to travel different areas. It will have the date of contract. It will have where they signed the contract. It will have um, the notary's name. It will have sometimes uh, what they were paid, how long they stayed, and so on. Uh, by using that information in the Voyagers database, you can go to our website, which uh, I'm not sure if you can see uh, down in here. You, there are uh, three the three pages for different notaries for Montreal, Quebec, and Trois-Rivières. Uh, if you can figure out where your notary was by, based on where they signed the contract, then you can go to one of these pages and look up the notary's name. And then uh, in those pages, it will have information about the notary. And it will also have links back to family search. And those links contain the actual notary records. So you can go to family search and you can go to that notary's records and search for the date of the contract and actual, find the actual uh, notarial records for that person. Uh, we also have a site with uh, links to parish records. Uh, we go uh, a little bit in depth into the breakdown of the Deet and Zeet names in uh, parish records, which can be somewhat confusing. Uh, there are additional podcasts here by Sandra Goodwin as well involving uh, how to search for parish records. Uh, there are examples of parish records, mostly baptismal, marriage, and death, but there are others as well. There are confirmations and so on. Uh, there are links to articles and research guides, uh, links to certain groups of parish records. Uh, some of them are paid sites, some of them are not. As you can see, uh, Assumption Church uh, can be found through Family Search. Uh, same thing for um, some of the others, but um, sites like um, St. Anne's Church uh, is through Ancestry, which you would need a paid membership for. Uh, the Drouin Collection can be accessed through Genealogy Quebec, 
but you also will have a, a to pay to access the actual records. You might be able to see an index for free. Uh, the same thing with PRDHIGD. You can examine the indexes for free, but you actually have to pay for the records themselves. Uh, but there are also records for the Huron Mission records and records for St. Mary's Catholic Church at Sault St. Marie. Uh, there's also links involving the diocese in Michigan, uh, specific Michigan records for Michigan's GenWeb, uh, the Debian Marriage Index, and Michigan death records too. <clears throat> On the lighter side, we also have a page for French, French Canadian, and traditional recipes and related articles. So if you love French food, this is a great place to find some new recipes to try. Uh, we also have a page for French Town, River Raisin, Monroe's um, early sites and records. Uh, we have another set of profiles of early families on this page, again, in alphabetical order. And then we have links to various different groups for the uh, French Town, Monroe area, the Genealogy Society of Monroe, uh, the Monroe County Historical Museum, the Monroe County Historical Society, the Monroe Public Library, the Navarra Anderson Trading Post, the River Raisin National Battlefield, and uh, some of our members uh, write a series of articles about the veterans of the War of 1812. Most of them come from that area. <clears throat> We also have a series of information on slavery in New France, uh, the background, uh, various different articles, some provided by the Virtual Museum of New France or the Canadian Encyclopedia. Uh, we have articles on uh, slave owners in the Detroit River region through 1762, stories of freed slaves, uh, additional book reviews, and even some slave owner enumerations and census records for the years 1750 and 1762. We also have another section completely on Native American and Métis history. And we basically cover these main areas, the 17th century locations, uh, Canadian resources, cultural information, uh, Detroit Métis families and Michigan resources. Uh, so we do have some maps on this page involving different areas of the tribes and even some of the migrations where they uh, started versus where they ended up. Uh, we have a list of Canadian resources, uh, specifically um, involving uh, Canadian Indigenous and the tea, uh, some Supreme Court cases, uh, Gail Moran's book, The First Metis Families of Quebec, uh, there's a link on here for it. Um, there is a Wikipedia article about the Indigenous people in Canada, reports involving Statistics Canada and the Canadian residential school system, uh, additional Metis articles, uh, and links to Library and Archives Canada, records from Canadian, Canadian Heritage, and also uh, links to the Gabriel Dumont Institute as well. We also have Native American cultural profiles uh, discussing in more detail uh, some categories like uh, agriculture and gathering practices, dress and ornamentation, fishing practices, homes and villages, manufacturing practices, travel and transportation, warfare and weapons, and even the Codex Canadensis images, uh, which you can kind of see down here a little bit, which is really very cool. Uh, we also have a link to Detroit Métis families. Um, Dennis Beauregard's link is here for the database, and it does involve uh, Métis founders as well. Um, we also have an alphabetical list of families within the Detroit R River region that are Métis, and additional related articles by Suzanne Somerville and Gail Moreau Desarnay. Uh, Articles involving the Cook family, uh, Agath LaSalle, um, and just various other different articles. We have um, Michigan American resources involving Native, Native Americans as well. 
uh, there is a Wikipedia list of the federally recognized tribes by state. We have the Mackinac County Michigan Gen Web Project, uh, various different census records uh, of the, like the 1836 Ottawa and Chippewa records, uh, the Gruet and Durant rolls, which are also cens census records for Native Americans, uh, records involving the land ceded by Michigan Native Americans, uh, United States laws and treaties, along with digitized ratified treaties within the new United States and the United States Census of Native Americans uh, from 1790 to 1930. And that is most of what is on our website. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Irene. This is Pat here, and there are um, one comment and then a, and then a question so far. Okay, um, nine people that they can post uh, post questions, and we'll uh, we'll get to them. The first uh, individual. This is more a comment. Suzanne says the 1762 census includes the South Coast, which is currently Windsor. On that is true. It is. So if um, if uh, people have ancestors in that area, they might check that out uh, for sure. And then we have a question here from Terry, who says, I have a French Canadian ancestor who worked in the fur trade for the Northwest Company and was born about 1765. I've never been able to find a voyageur contract nor a baptism record for him in the Quebec records. I wonder if he might have been on the other side of the border, such as Michigan. And the question is how to find out. Okay, well, I would definitely start by looking in the Voyager database if possible, because if he was on this side of the border, there is a good chance you could find him there. And uh, I would also not limit yourself when you're searching by certain spelling, be broad. Uh, their, their spelling wasn't always uh, accurate. And so I would try searching under various different spellings of your surname as well. Um, you might find that uh, in the records, it could be just misspelled. Okay, so I hope that helps Terry out. Um, Cindy here says, wow, talk about a one-stop shop. <laughs> there is a lot of information on there. There really is. Uh, you know, I mean, I could easily talk for another hour to go into depth on what's on each page, but I'd really rather you just go and check it out. Go and browse and uh, check out all these pages. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of free information on our site. There really is. Well, and that brings us to a few people have asked this question. Um, what is on the members only section? If all of that is available to non-members, is there more for members? There is. Um, mostly there is the journal content. Uh, there are also some individual articles as well, which are under that members only category where uh, if you're a member, then you can access those additional articles of content. Okay. You know, a lot of the other information is free to everybody, but our journal content is really where the gold is. Uh, we have a great deal of wealth of information in those journal articles. And so it, it's definitely worth uh, a membership to, to access them. Yeah. And um, I think I saw where you have access to journals that go way, way back. It's not just the um, correct just yes. ones. So. Yeah, it's, uh, our journals have been digitized as far back as 2007. Mm -hmm. Which is 14 years. That's mm -hmm. hard to believe. It's yeah. <laughs> um, Linda is asking, where would I find a marriage record for a Scotsman who is not Catholic, who married a French girl who was Catholic in the 1780s? Mm, that is a good question. Um, I'm 
does she have, I mean, I think more information is needed. I think um, the key is location. Uh, I think uh, narrowing it down by location and seeing uh, what parishes were in that location. Um, if you can't find them in a specific parish set of records, then uh, you might need to try other sources. Um, but I, I would start with trying parish records. It's just one of those uh, great categories because uh, it's possible they could be in Canadian records or French Canadian uh, Catholic records uh, with her, but it's hard to know for sure. Lorraine, so, hi, it's Linda. It's Linda. Yes. Um, it, this is my question. It, the gentleman was a Scotsman who refused to have anything to do with the Catholic religion. So he did not get, they did not get married in a Catholic church. Okay. Although the Catholic Church seems to have recognized the marriage because the children that uh, the, the woman got baptized in the Catholic Church, it did say the legitimate marriage. It didn't okay. say illegitimate or anything like that. Um, and it was in the 1780s, so in Detroit. So I thought okay. it would be in, would, that, would a notary, um, like would a Scotsman go to a notary? Uh, he probably, it's I don't possible if he's not, if he's not going to go to the Catholic church, then, you know, they would have had to be somewhere else. And a civil record of some type probably makes more sense. Would the, would the commandant of the fort perform a marriage yes they are definitely uh one that could do that and do you have any records of the commandant's um marriages specifically no but you know again it's something that you might be able to search for within sets of notarial records uh it's trying to uh figure out Based on those years and where the fort, you know, going to the fort, who was the notary in those years uh, around the marriage? And then you want to look at the notarial records for that person across those years. And Great. that will probably narrow it down for you. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Linda, someone is asking, Suzanne is asking, what is the name of the Scotsman? I don't know whether she's got a connection to somebody that is sounding familiar or. <laughs> oh, it's James Urquhart. Um, Urquhart is my my uh, husband's surname. And he married Genevieve uh, Droulard in the 1780s sometime. Uh, they had a child in 1786. I think she was a widow. She had been married to Edward Ridley. Anyway, I didn't want to take up time on, on this, just uh, but that's who they were. So Suzanne, if that sounds familiar, you can reach Linda at EssexResearch at ogs.on.ca. Um, okay, we have another question. Do you have any, from Cindy, do you have any sort of correspondence, i.e. letters between family members who may have lived on either side of the border? Specifically, I do not. I have, I know of correspondence from Port St. Joseph to St. Louis. So it's entirely possible. Okay, and then related to the border again, Suzanne asks, was the border open? I found that the family members that we have traced so far moved back and forth across the Detroit River, Detroit, Windsor, Amherstburg. When yes, there, there was no serious divider for the most part. Uh, they didn't have customs. They didn't have delineating lines, it was much easier to just go back and forth. Even once the English took over, it was, you know, no different really for, you know, many years. Even when the Americans took over, then uh, I, there was still uh, a long period of time where uh, it wasn't really classified as uh, country versus country. Mm -hmm. Now, she also asks, do you know how to obtain records from Elois? We don't know how our paternal ancestors settled in Essex County. From where? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. E-L-O-I-S-E. 
Oh, um, I really can't answer that question. I'm not. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure on that. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions or comments right now. I'm looking here, I think we've covered any kids. Oops. Here, Elois is where our paternal ancestor died. It was an institution. Oh, okay. And where was it? Can you type that answer in, Suzanne, and we can... <laughs> Detroit. Oh, it was in Detroit. Hmm. I know that there were a couple of them. Uh, I know there were a couple of poor houses as well, but the records are not always easy to research. I will indicate that. Um, one of the things you might want to try if, if you haven't yet, uh, try looking in census records. They did take censuses of those who were in institutions of various different types and they would be on there. It might give you some little clues as to uh, where to look to narrow things down. Sorry. Well, if that's all the questions. Um... Linda, I think we've got one more. Okay. Sorry, I had my mic muted. Uh, was it common for border people to be married on either side of the border in the early 1800s? Yes, especially if they were, you know, I mean, French Canadians had family on both sides of the border, so they, they went back and forth regularly. Nothing like that's been in during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing like that at all. <laughs> um. Okay, I think that's all I'm seeing right now, Linda. Okay, uh, I just wanted to thank Lorraine for a very informative presentation. I've used uh, your website for many, many years and I thought I knew what, what you had, but I just found out today that you have a lot more that I'm gonna have to take a look at because I didn't realize that maybe you've added more since I first started, but <laughs> thanks again. Uh, it's been great to have you. Uh, we also want to thank everybody for joining us tonight, and I hope you take advantage of some of the educational opportunities that others are presenting for the next few months, but we will see you again in 2022. So well, thank night. you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.